Hey everyone, welcome back to Add to Your Faith Ministries Synoptic Gospel Study. I'm Elizabeth Lenny Bardhan, and today we are looking at weeds among the wheat, also known as the wheat and the tares parable and explanation. Now, if you're just joining us, be sure and like and subscribe. Um, I would love to be able to see who is watching um, our videos and participating in our series. So if you subscribe to this series um, and to the channel, you'll be able to get the updated videos as well as liking and commenting on the video. It lets me see who's participating. Now, we are only going to be looking at Matthew chapter 13 today. Um, this is not uh, one of our parables that we find across the Synoptic Gospels. It is simply in Matthew. So uh, we're going to be reading both the Matthew parable as well as the explanation. So start in Matthew uh, 13, verse 24, and recognize your context. This is just right after the parable of the sower. And when Christ explains what the sower means, then we have the next parable, which is parable of the weeds. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So, when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, now... This could have lots of different interpretations and uh, meanings that different teachers and different pastors could apply to this passage. But thankfully, Jesus gave us what he actually meant by the passage. He explained it so we don't have to guess um, or have bad theology. So if you will look at verse 36, we will look at the explanation. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shrine, sorry, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, um, I think this parable is extremely interesting because... Jesus is revealing things about the end of the age that is so debated in modern church. Um, I saw an online debate recently on Facebook where on a Christian page uh, where, you know, some people are saying, oh, there is no rapture because only Paul talks about it. Jesus does not. And there's that whole movement right now where people want to discredit the Bible and say that, um, if it's something that's written by Paul, then it, we don't have to call it scripture. Those were his opinions, and some of it's good and some of it's not. You can pick what you like type mentality, uh, where if Jesus said it, then it's definitely scripture. Now, that's a terrible mentality um, for any Christian to have, because when you start discrediting the word of God, and you start saying that the Bible is not inspired, and you can pick which passages you want to believe and which passages you do not want to believe, you're creating your own religion and your own God. Now, God has made it clear that he inspired the word. He told us that he did it, and that is part of faith, is believing that. If you cannot believe that God is powerful enough to preserve his word, and to communicate his message through the human authors that he used through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that that message has not been preserved for us today, then what is your faith in? You can believe that God could give you eternal life, but you can't believe he can give you his word. 
It's a real question of faith, who you think God is, what do you believe he can do, that comes into question if you choose to disbelieve the word of God. So with that said, uh, because that is such a th- repeated theme I'm hearing in lots of different groups, people coming and saying, come, a man came to our church one day and said that um, he didn't follow the teachings of Paul. He only followed Jesus. Um, that's a very upsetting statement of, uh, because we get so much church doctrine and, uh, valuable God inspired directions for life from Paul's practical teachings. And when you just say, no, I just don't want to believe in the new Testament. I'm going to throw that out. I'm only going to follow Christ. Then one, you're ignoring the fact that Christ is one who inspired that scripture, but also you are limiting yourself to the things that Jesus chose to reveal through his own words uh, and ignoring the things that he revealed through other authors. So it's a very dangerous way to establish Christianity. I also saw someone say the very same thing on Instagram the other day. Uh, there was a Christian posting. Um, Christian is, uh, I'm not sure really what that person's position was, if it was meant to mock Christianity or if it was coming from a place of faith. I'm not sure. Um, but at any rate, the, the post was addressing some of the issues going on. Apparently, I don't know anything about this, but apparently in the American church, there's something going on with, uh, women in ministry right now. And so this person's post used a lot of bad language and was saying how that it's only basically men's bad view of women rather than a lack of God ability that keeps women from being in pastoral positions in the church. So you have all of these people commenting on that. And what I saw a few times, people saying, oh, well, that's just because it's Paul's writings that women are supposed to preach. So see what happens when we start taking ideas that we want to create as theology and say, I want women to be able to pastor a church. So I'm going to say that the passage of scripture that says women should not do that was written by Paul. And so therefore it was Paul's opinion. Jesus didn't say it, so I don't have to do it. Um, if the Bible says it, Jesus says it. He says that he is the word. Um, so in that reality, we have to accept what the Bible says as the word of Christ, all of it. If Paul wrote it, or if Samuel wrote it, or if Moses wrote it, or if Matthew wrote it, these are the words of Christ. Now, what happens as these kind of theologies and ideas are spread, where people create their own ideas, their own theologies, their own gods, they change the Bible and they make whatever religion they want up, but maybe keep it under the Christian name. This covers cults, um, this covers divergent um, new religions, etc. What you have is what Jesus is describing with the weeds and the wheat. Um, they may look like Christians in the sense that they say that they love Jesus, they sing the same worship music, they may create the worship music, um, and they have a really great outward appearance of godliness, etc. Um, but their teachings are in some way false. There's something divergent about what they are saying that is not scriptural. Those are the weeds. Um, you have to look at Jesus's passage and see exactly what he is saying. Um, he says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Okay, so Jesus is the one who is planting the wheat. The wheat, the seed of wheat that's being planted is sown by Jesus Christ. All right. Um, we can understand that those are the true born again believers. Now, in our last passage, the seeds of the um, good seed that Jesus was sowing was the word of God itself. But in this one, um, it is showing to be more of the people, uh, more than the teaching. But let's just look at this. The field is the world. Now, please notice that the location of this teaching is the world. The field is the world. Verse 38 says, um, some people teach that this is just the church, that the church itself will have wheat and tear, good and bad, and that, you know, we can't take out the bad because then we're affecting the good, but that's in contradiction of other passages that teach church discipline. Um, so this is the, what Jesus is talking about is the world. He, that's what he says. The field is the world. 
And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. Again, so Jesus is the one sowing the seed. And what the seed is are the sons of the kingdom. Those are the Christians. True believers actually on their way to heaven, saved, redeemed, born again, any of that terminology that you want to use, the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. Okay, so those are Satan's people. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. All right, so it's very clear that Jesus has people all over the world that he has planted that are his redeemed people. And Satan has his people all over the world who are his sons. The harvest is the close of the age. Now, we understand from Paul's writings and other portions of scripture that we have the rapture, the millennial reign, the end of the age, everything that we see in Revelation, all that. Jesus says at the close of the age that this is what's going to happen. And the reapers are angels. All right. So just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire. So that's back to his analogy of the actual weeds being burned in a field. So, so in the same way, so will it be at the close of the age. The son of man, Jesus, will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's the expression that's um, used often to describe hell, the place of torture and damnation for all those who do not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, I I think this one's especially important in talking about the kingdom of heaven. Because we talk about the kingdom of heaven, and oftentimes it's kind of this undefined idea of like Christianity. We'll think that, well, the church age is the kingdom of heaven, or um, just whatever's Christian is the kingdom of heaven, or... um, just the people of God themselves are like the family of God is often uh, created to mean the same thing as the kingdom of heaven. But I think what we see in this passage is these layers of reality. We have our human perspective of earth. We do not see the spiritual world. We are involved in spiritual warfare, but we don't always see it. Uh, It's very often ignored so much. Um, that we just don't even have the eyes to see it or the ears to hear it. But there is the spiritual world that's all around us. In the spiritual world, we have the kingdom of heaven at hand. It's right here. It's not just the end of the age. It's not just heaven. Um, It's not just the new world, whatever. It is right now at hand, scripture says. So um, you have the kingdom of heaven and you have Satan's world. I don't really know what his is called except the the world. Um, When you have evil... And the spiritual darkness, the powers of evil have their world and their plans and what they're doing with it, Um, their battle strategies and everything that's going on on this level. And you have the kingdom of heaven on this level. And that's everything that God is doing through his people. And what, as the sons of the kingdom, as the, the seeds that Jesus has planted are all over the world doing the work of God. And so Satan also has his people all over the world doing the work of evil. And, but what's interesting in this parable is not just the spiritual darkness and the spiritual light, the two worlds that are, you know, overlapping the human experience, um, but that they look the same. And that's the, the reason that usually this parable is interpreted as meaning like false teachers, false theologies, um, cults, or anything that masquerades as a Christian. Because we can clearly see evil that's evil. You know, the the serial killer who gets arrested, no one says, oh, um, you know, I wonder if he was representing Jesus. Well, no. Okay, there's a clear difference between evil that is open and then evil that hides behind the name of religion. So when we see the wheat being the seeds of the kingdom, the sons of the kingdom, the Christians that Jesus has planted around the world, and we see the seeds that Satan has planted looking just like the wheat. You can't tell the difference when they're planted, when it's growing, until later in the season when the um, the head begins to develop on the wheat is when you can tell the difference between the wheat and the tares is what I was reading. Um, it's only through that development that we see it then what you have is something that looks very close to a Christian, but can 
you know, in its development and in its observation, you can tell the difference, but it's very difficult. So you have Satan's seeds of religious people and you have Jesus's actual real true followers that are walking alongside each other on the planet. And it's very hard to tell the difference. And so the angels ask Jesus, do you want us to go get all of the Satan's plants? Do you want us to pull them up? Do you want us to get those false religious people out of the way so that there's no confusion between the Christians and Satan's nemesises? Well, not Satan's nemesis, our nemesises. <laughs> nemesises. It's a fun word. Okay. So when the angels ask this, Jesus's response is, no, don't do that. Because if you pull up Satan's plants and you might get some of my plants. Um, now I don't fully understand what the complete theological ramifications of that would be since we do believe in the eternal security of the believer. Um, what it would mean to remove that. But I think one definition or one explanation of what Jesus says there is that if we try to unmask like a false teacher, a false religion, a cult, um, bad theologies, etc., like I was talking about in the beginning. If we try to um, just call those people out um, and fight with them on the internet or um, in person or in writing or whatever, then what we do is we may pull them up, but we have a tendency to offend and pull up others as well. Um, for example, there's, there's a very famous, uh, there's, several actually, disturbingly, very famous worship music creating churches that make a lot of the worship music that churches use today. Um, one's in America and one's in another country. And these groups create really great worship music that is good worship music. But these groups have also been known to identify with some weird theology. One of the groups teaches some very strange things about angels and the other has been embroiled in some different um, issues. And people say, okay, does that mean that none of the music is good? Um, and that's a different discussion than what we're having today, but in the, it's in the same line. So in talking about that, if something that someone creates, like worship music or a book, um, is in itself good, then just because the unit they're connected to has something strange doesn't mean it itself is bad. But we have to be very careful in evaluating it because the wheat and the tear. Something can look very, very close to the seeds that Jesus plants and it not be. So we have to be aware of what's what the, the concept of the false teachers and testing them by their fruit. We're supposed to look for that fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long suffering, that fruit of the spirit. Like what is the result of the teaching? Does it result in the godliness of the fruit of the spirit or does it result in fruit of the flesh? The different sins that are listed under, under that. Um, if we evaluate worship music and Christian literature and Christian fiction and Christian art, anything has Christian in front of it, but it's a mainstream form of entertainment, Christian movies. Uh, all these things are created by all kinds of people. I mean, the Mormons have an incredible choir and I've watched some of their YouTube videos. I mean, they're really good musical performances of different great music, but we do know that they have false teaching, that they are a cult. So what do we do with that? What is the reconciliation between having something that's been created by what's clearly a tear and using it as wheat. Um, and again, I think we have to look at what Jesus says. He says, don't snatch them out because if you do, you might snatch some of the right ones out. That's what he tells the angels. And as we are evaluating between what is the seeds of Christ and what are the seeds of Satan, um, we have to remember what Jesus um, said earlier to the Pharisees, when they blaspheme saying that what Jesus did was by the devil and they, because of that blasphemy, their hearts were hardened and they were not ever, ever able to be forgiven for that. And if Jesus is doing something through someone and we look at them and say, I bet you're one of those seeds of the devil. Then if Jesus is the one doing it, we're blaspheming. So that we have to be extremely cautious as Jesus says, don't pull up one. You might get the other. Um, 
we have to prayerfully observe and follow the Holy Spirit and follow these principles in Scripture and understand that in the end of the age, the angel reapers will come and they will take out all of the false religions, all the things that have hidden and looked like Christianity, all the wrong teachings, all the wrong art, everything that's been associated with Christianity but has been planted by Satan, they will take all of that out and they will burn it. And what the, what's left, the actual seeds that Christ has planted, is going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now that's fabulous. We definitely want to be a part of the shining kingdom, not a part of the burning kingdom. Um, now, Jesus presents two different end of time events. You have hell. Yeah, they'll be thrown into the fiery furnace where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you have the kingdom of the Father where the righteous will shine like the sun. Um, we normally term these things heaven and hell. Um, I think this is bigger than just heaven because, you know, if you look at Revelation and some of the prophecies, then, then we understand that there will be a new heaven and a new earth that's going to be remade. Um, at the end of the age, after the rapture, after the tribulation period, um, there will be this new and amazing heaven on earth, literally recreated, where we are going to be able to live with God. Now, almost every religion has a version of heaven. Um, not all of them, but majority have a very positive end and then also a negative end for those who do wrong. Um, Satan has planted these ideas, these seeds that look like truth in other religions as well. So this doesn't just mean that they can be false Christians or false like cults inside of Christianity. If you look at Islam, if you look at Hinduism, if you look at Buddhism, if you look at, oh, I don't know, most of all of our main religions, um, what you have is a system that Satan has created that will have little nuggets of truth that make it feel right or feel good to the human soul, but yet has been planted by Satan and not by Christ. Now, these look very different from the sons of the kingdom, but from their perspective, they believe that they are sons of God. You look at Islam, those, the ones who are very devout, very faithful, they feel like they are following God they're following the book that they believe he has written, that they are being authentic and true in faith and what they do. At the end of the age, they will find out that the God they were serving is not the right God, which is a horrible thing to think about. Someone living in, in deep and true faith in the wrong thing. That also, I believe, is a part of the, the tears that Satan plants. Uh, because in practice, in faith, in worship, in behavior, in emotion, that the way the person lives and feels is the same as the sons of the kingdom. They are a faithful, a moral person. But in the end, they're the ones that are, ha are having faith not in the Father. So I think it's really important as we look at people who believe things that are different than us, um, maybe they are, as I said, Muslim or Hindu or Jain or Buddhist or Shinto or whatever. Um, maybe they're of a, you know, a cult like the Shindoshi, not the Shindoshi, that's where we live. The, <laughs> sorry, that's the wrong word. Um, the, wow, I can't remember the, the Korean cult word that's that cult that spread COVID all over Korea and made everyone hate churches. Anyway, there's lots of cults. There's lots of Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims, uh, Muslims. I think I'm pretty tired tonight. Mormons, all the different groups that are either divergent from Christianity or they're completely different religions. All of them have, um, a pattern of behavior, of faith, of practice, of diligence, of, um, good qualities like patience or kindness, uh, giving money to the poor, things like that. These patterns of moral behavior that Satan has stuck into um, the seeds of his wrong religions. And people have that 
spark of God where we know that there is a God and just what they're told the God is, is wrong. And they follow him faithfully the way they're told to, and they live a moral life and they look like wheat. You know, if you had two of them walking side by side down the street, you couldn't tell who was the faithful person of this religion, who's the faithful person of that religion. Now, that's not always true, but with that in mind, Satan has twisted and confused the minds of millions of people around the world. And we normally think of Satan's work being a work of fear, but sometimes he uses faith. He just puts their faith in the wrong thing. And to me, that's the, the much more terrifying method than the way Satan uses evil to cause fear or to cause anxiety or whatever. The, the reality is we are supposed to be diligently living as sons of the kingdom. Because in this parable, there's really not a Christian person. There's Jesus, there's Satan, there's the angels. And then there's what they're all talking about. Who is us? We are the passive objects in this parable. As the wheat or the weeds, we are simply the ones that are being dealt with, either harvested for the kingdom of God or harvested to be burned. And it's very important that we recognize there's nothing we can do about this. I am not harvesting other people. I'm not planting the other people. Um, all of these things are the works of God and his angels or of the evil one. What I am supposed to be doing, the directions for me as a person of the kingdom are found in other parables. But in this parable, Jesus is giving us a perspective from heaven um, that we usually don't get. If Jesus hadn't revealed these things, we wouldn't understand things like the end of the age or the harvesting of souls. Like that's not something that we would understand. Thankfully, because of what Jesus said and what Paul um, reveals in Second Thessalonians and the different writings he has about the rapture, and we look at what John has in Revelation, then we have more ideas of what this end of the age looks like. But in reality, there's nothing we can do about the end of the age. There's nothing about we can do um, about any of this except live as the seeds of Christ, to live by faith in the one who has planted us. The, that should make us kind of feel small. Um, there is no sense of pride or sense of power that comes with realizing, oh, I'm a son of the kingdom and they're the son of Satan. It shouldn't be anything like that except compassion because those who have been planted by Satan, they don't know they've been planted by Satan. They're just living life. Now, it is very important, as Peter says, that we test our salvation with fear and trembling because those who have been planted by Satan look really similar to those who have been planted by Christ. They may be planted in the Christian church doing the same things religiously and may be planted, as I said, in a different religion. I think that the application for today's lesson um, is one, not to judge other people. Because if we start plucking them up and judging them, we might get the wrong person. If I start saying who I think belongs to Satan, I might be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's not my place. That's not my job. That's the angel's job that are directed by Jesus. And I am, I'm not in that list of people doing stuff, so I don't need to do it. So no judging, no removing people other than the clear guidelines of church discipline, which is not about plucking people out. It's about boundaries and guidance. Um, that's a whole different lesson. This is not about church discipline, but it is about when we, when we judge people as not being Christians or we try to remove them from the group without having the right Holy Spirit unction. What do you do if you find someone in your church or in your community that you believe really has been planted by Satan? <laughs> they are not the seed of Jesus. You're just like, no, this is, this is definitely the seed of Satan. And, you know, I'm not being sarcastic. Like, you will meet people who are the seed of Satan. This passage makes that clear. They have been planted. <laughs> they are there to cause evil. What does Jesus say? The ones that are removed. Those who cause sin and all lawbreakers. They're the ones who are going to be gathered up and burned. So who, like, in your church or in your community is the one who causes sin? Who are the lawbreakers? Is it you? If it is, repent while you still can. 
The one thing that's great about this is Satan may try to plant you, but Jesus can replant you. Being born again be, means being changed from something that Satan is using to being purchased by Jesus. Here, sins have been nailed to the cross. They've been You've been washed in his blood. The payment has been made. You no longer are a seed of Satan, but you are planted and useful to Jesus Christ. So if you realize that you are on the wrong side, that you are being used by Satan to cause sin, to bring lawlessness, disorder, discouragement, any kind of negativity thing, that you know that's your purpose and that Satan has put you there. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then you can be planted and useful to the kingdom of God and living forever with him. But if you do not choose to repent, and for those who don't repent, what do we do with them? How do we react to these people? The first thing to do when you see someone, again, is don't judge because it may just be you don't like their personality and you don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So the first thing you do when you meet someone is you pray for them. You have a weird feeling about that person. You don't like their personality. You don't like the things they do You or you see them doing wrong. Like they are bringing sin into the church or into your community. You know that that lawlessness and that law breaking mentality of causing others to sin or doing sin themselves is literally who this person is. The first thing you do is pray. Pray for yourself that you do not judge them and you do not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Pray that you can know what to say and how God wants to use you in this person's life. Because remember, we've been planted by Christ. We are to be useful to him, growing for him, a useful crop that he can bring into the kingdom. And as such, don't get prideful and think that you can deal with anyone who is not on the Lord's side. Prayerfully ask God if there is anything that you should do for, about this person while you pray for them. Pray for their souls. If you can recognize that this person is most likely planted by Satan, then you are seeing someone who is not a Christian. So pray for their soul that they can be redeemed. Pray that God opens their heart so that the seed of the gospel can find a place that is planted in good soil and can grow. Pray that that person has a lot of opportunities for their soil of their heart to improve and for the seeds of the gospel to plant. Then you look for those opportunities to help that person's soil improve if they're in your church, teaching them, admonishing them, guiding them, constantly giving them the gospel. If the word of God cannot change them, one, either they don't need to change or you're judging the wrong thing and it's something else God's working on, or two, they will probably leave because truth constantly gospeling, gospel, gospel someone, that conviction is very hard. They'll either harden their heart or they'll run away. Now, if they harden their heart and they don't leave, they don't get saved, they don't leave, they just get harder. Um, again, constantly praying, asking God to guide you how to deal with this person. Because this is not someone that you can just talk to and correct or redirect them with a little bit of knowledge and guidance. This is someone that Satan has planted and is using to cause catastrophe. Um, there are sins that God hates. You think of like the pride, gossip, dissension among brethren, murder, lying. These are things that if you see someone is doing that, they're gossiping in the church or in the community, they're causing people to hate each other, or to be divided. Um, there's other negative things that are happening because of what they're saying or doing, then, you know, there's a real good chance that they're a seed of Satan. Now, that just gives us a good target for who to share the gospel with. Because there's no doubt on which side, well, there should be some doubt because we don't judge. There is um, a high percentage chance that they need Jesus. Even if they say that they're a Christian, if they think that they're a Christian, they need the true gospel. Your attitude and your perceptions on that person makes a big difference. If you go in with kindness and gentleness, then people are going to hear you better than if you go in with anger and attack. So think about online. Talk some about church, but I've used the word community a lot. Our social networks have become a community. You have a group of people that you follow, that you like, that you watch, that you listen to online. And there's also another group of people that you do not know, but you see what they have to say. It's all over the internet and people fight with each other. One side of Christians versus another side of Christians, one political side versus another political side, one view of vaccines versus another view of vaccines. 
and masks and medical professionals and everyone has become a virologist and knows everything about viruses now, etc., etc., etc. Oh, the amount of human pride and anger that is displayed is masking so much fear, so much fear. And that fear is never given by God. God does not give fear. God gives warnings, but he doesn't give fear. Fear is from Satan. He generally, what we can say is Satan gives fear. God does not. God says, do not fear. Now, if he can give direct command that says, don't do it, then we know that it's something that he is not causing. Fear running rampant in people's words all over the internet is not a very mentally well thing to expose yourself to. And again, I think the modern way that Satan has planted seeds is online, not just in person or in churches. Online, you find these horrifyingly fear-causing, anger-causing, hate-causing words, ideas, videos. Be very careful what you're exposing yourself to. Remember, as people of the kingdom, we have to be living in the kingdom, not living in Satan's realm, filling our minds with the realm of Satan. Um, I've said a lot of things that are kind of maybe feeling disconnected, but I, I believe that it's all connected. Everything is either the wheat that Christ is planting or the weed that Satan is planting. We are all one or the other. Which one are you? If you're not sure, make sure, get down on your knees Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. Put your faith and trust in him. Surrender your life to him. Let him be your Lord and Savior. Give up your life to him, and he will purchase you from Satan. If you have peace that you have given your heart to Christ, then check yourself. What are you doing that is living more in the realm of what Satan is planting than what Christ is planting? Are you letting them lead you into sin. Because as this expression in this verse is that those who cause sin are going to be taken away, just like the ones who are the actual lawbreakers. The ones who do sin and the ones who cause sin and the one the angels are going to throw into hell. Um, don't cause someone to sin. Um, Jesus talks about that also in the offending, not to offend a little one because um, you will be cast into hell. That same expression is used. Like giving offense or causing someone to sin is a really serious thing that God is watching. So be careful for that. But... In all of these um, principles that we see, um, and wherever you see yourself, I think the biggest thing is to never uh, assume a fatalism. Ah, well, I'm a seed of Satan. I can only do bad. Um, that's, That's not true. If you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's still hope. Now, once your heart is hardened and you no longer want to know God, then there's no hope um, because you don't want it anymore. Uh, But for those who want to know Christ, then there is still hope for you. All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You do have to understand that in that submission, what you're accepting is him as your Lord and Savior to obey him. Um, And that in that exchange, he will give you the ability to obey him by giving you his spirit. That's the end is the kingdom of the father. We're all shining as the sun in righteousness. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, or the other end, because you've caused sin and done sin and not been forgiven, is to burn in hell. All of us have caused sin or done sin. The important thing is that it's repented of, confessed, and forgiven, washed in the blood of Christ. As the ones who have been planted by Christ, that's the life that we are are living. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But those who do not have an advocate with Jesus, those who are choosing or don't know and are continuing in a life of sin without repentance and faith, then those are the ones who will be gathered up and burned. So I love that in this passage, we get this perspective from heaven of all, all things happening on earth, the things that Satan are planting and the things that Christ has planted, the people that are planted, the ideas that are planted, the practices that are planted, the religions that are planted. Like I, I, I see so much in this and maybe I'm applying it too much. You know, maybe it's over, over applying it. But I think in today's issues with like the COVID virus, I see so many things that I believe are planted by Satan. Fear, as I said, it comes not from God. The human heart and Satan create fear. 
And as that is spread so diligently around the planet, um, that it, it feels to me the work of literally the work of Satan. Um, we, we need to be very careful what we're afraid of because God said, don't fear. So if you're afraid or terrified of the virus or terrified of getting sick or of dying, um, you need to step back from that and ask God to give you the right perspective and to remove the things that Satan has planted in your mind that has resulted in this fear, the things that you've allowed in your mind. Satan can't plant in your mind if you're a Christian, but you can allow him to by the things that you listen to, watch, read, and interact with online, on the television, etc. But be careful not to go too far into the conspiracy world. You don't want to be one of the people that are running around screaming, don't get the vaccine, don't wear a mask, it's all a conspiracy. Um, that's unhealthy. You know, because um, the fear behind that, that drives that kind of um, behavior is really a lot more unhealthy than wearing a mask. Just do your duty, wear your mask, soon we'll be able to take them off. Don't let it be something that defines you, controls you, or becomes that um, unbreakable part of your heart where you just sit suddenly and say, I, I'm afraid to do this, so I won't. There are things that we should be concerned about doing and not doing, and those things are sin. Um, taking medicine or wearing a mask. If you're afraid of doing those things, you have to ask yourself why. Who planted that fear in your heart? Why is it there? What are you actually afraid of? How much do you really understand about it? How much have you just read on the internet, Google News, or YouTube, and think that you know everything about it? Satan plants ideas. He plants fear. He plants anger. He plants hate. None of that is planted by Jesus. So be careful if you're feeling the movement of hate or anger or fear or tremors of those kind of sins are in your heart, then it's been caused by someone that Satan has planted. You've allowed them to get into your mind. So be careful what you read, what you see, what you interact with, because the ones that Satan has planted, they are active. I hope that we are just as active as the people of the kingdom of God, that when Jesus has planted us in the places that he has planted us in different parts of the world, that we are as active in spreading his love and his light as Satan's people are active in spreading fear and anger and hate. Spread the love of Jesus, spread the fruit of the spirit, keep that love, joy, patience, etc., being what radiates from your soul um, so that God can use us for his kingdom that is now, as he says, it is at hand. All right, I've taken enough time. Woo, 42 minutes. I was talkative tonight. If you made it this far in the video and you haven't shut me off yet, Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I would love to see a comment of who made it this far. And I'd love to hear your ideas and your thoughts. What do you think Satan has planted in your life? Are there people, are there, careful with that one, are there things, are there ideas that you've believed, things that you've been afraid of? Um, is there someone that you realize has caused you to sin that's in your life and you know that, um, that they have been used by Satan to cause you to sin? Uh, are there sins that you're doing that's unconfessed? Any of these things that we see, uh, if you'd like to talk about that or share your ideas in the comments below or in an email at addtoyourfaithministries at gmail.com, uh, I would love to hear from you and get your ideas. If you have some a different idea of what the wheat or the weeds is are, um, then please let me know how you interpret this passage in any way that's different or how God's blessed you today through this message. And I would love to hear from you. All right. God bless. Take care. Bye.